Good afternoon, I'm Conrad van Deventer. Um, I'm CDO at Circular, and um, we develop supply chain traceability software. So today I'll talk a little bit about the, our traceability solution and how we're making use of Hyperledger Fabric as part of that platform. So to give an overview, so yeah, illuminating, um, global electric vehicle battery supply chains using Hyperledger Fabric. Um, so these are complex global supply chains that underpin the critical minerals necessary to make electric vehicle batteries. These minerals come with a host of, responsibility, with a host of responsible and sustainable sourcing challenges, um, introdu including child labor, sanctioned countries, environmental damage, and substantial in a substantial inherited carbon footprint. Uh, traceability help to, helps auto manufacturers to see into the supply chains to right to the source of the minerals so that they can drive improvement. Um, the circular platform using Hyperledger Fabric and traditional database, uh, databases is used to create supply chain traceability and digital product passports for electric vehicles. And the platform is currently being used by numerous auto OEMs um, at scale to underpin e US EV tax credits as well as EU battery passports. So to sort of, I'll, I'll explain a bit about the solution first and how we do the traceability and then go into the technology bit and see how we use um, blockchain and other uh, technology components. So, to, so first we look at where the data is actually coming from and for traceability and CO2 emissions. So the, so on the left there, so this is um, tracking materials when from the mine site right through until it's a EV battery and then in, in that car. So on initially to digitize some of that information, we got a mobile app that can be used in the first mile. So normally artisanal mine sites or areas where there isn't a lot of technology available already. Um, in order to register that item and start the create a digital twin of it and then start to track that physical be that physical material the platform trace uh, is tracking physical material throughout the supply chain so it's not um, running off purchase orders or just finance systems but it's uh, looking at the real identifiers on the items and then tracking those as they move throughout the supply chain so as we, so each one of these, so process one, two, three, four, assembly and final product, each one of these represent a um, unique uh, organization that is involved in that part of the supply chain. So it might be a mine in process one, a refinery in two, and then getting more complicated as that raw materials are refined and eventually become, it goes into a battery that's manufactured and then that battery being put into a electric vehicle. So each one of these are set up as a um, entity on the platform and then we work with them and then for that entity we look at the data attributes that we need to capture as well as the their processes. So is it more um, just goods in and goods out that we need to track or is it a more high risk area where we like to get multiple data points throughout the processing in order to um, evaluate if the if say, if the data quality is good and there isn't any anomalies in there. Um, so yeah, in the in the first bit is like we got a mobile app, but the in the rest of the supply chain we normally find that it's very industrial already. They already got IT systems available, so we try to. Um, integrate, well, we try to make endpoints available for them to integrate into our system and not disrupt any of their current processes, but just trying to reuse some of the data they already have and then feed that into our platform that can then, with a set of business rules and a rules engine, can then link the data together and then also highlight any anomalies or any problems depending on the, the risk areas. Um, yeah, so through this, so for example, we, so yeah, through this we can prove where the origin, where it's coming from, um, the journey it's taken, the logistics about it, 
and we can also add, the, as we track the physical material, we can also then um, use the, apply the, get the energy usage for a specific facility to attribute that to the materials to each one of the products. So we can then, depending where in the world the company is, we can look at which uh, CO2 factors need to be used, and then we can apply those factors and determine the CO2 footprint for each one of the items that has been produced. So it's not just a LCA that was done in general once every 12 or 18 months, but it could be as not real time, but as more frequently than that um, in order to show then in a final customer supply chain where the hotspots are and where the most polluting areas are that's contributing to their products. So in a platform, there's so there's uh, yeah traceability and emission tracking data and dashboards available that then can show the final customer, um, well each one of the participants in upstream from them in their supply chain where um, the, yeah all the data about the items which they are getting and then as that's flowing through to their customers as well. So for example, the origin of the raw materials the volume by region, uh, the flow of raw and recycled materials. Uh, you can then yeah, model this in detail, detect, we also have a rules agent, so we can determine if there's one ton of material arriving somewhere and that can produce 300 items. We can then check that it always adheres to that rule and then highlight if there's any um, problems with that. So if there's any unknown, um, material input from unknown provenance. So if a organization uh, want to prove or want to check that in their supply chain, if they're buying uh, recycled material and a supplier claims there's either 100% or 20% recycled material, that they can account for that recycled material actually coming from a recycler, but there's proof throughout the supply chain. And you, just, you don't just rely on a contract that might have been signed some time ago, or you're just your tier one, but if there isn't a recycler in that network, then well, there's a problem, or if they don't have any proof of it. So yeah, we can also do, we also do the CO2 calculations then, but in addition to traceability and CO2, there's also a um, compliance module and ESG module for, for organizations to be able to upload um, any regulatory documentation that we can then link to the products as well and to the final items so to see if they had the right certificate at the point in time when a certain item has been manufactured. So by using all of that data then, the traceability, the CO2, compliance, ESG, we can then combine all that and create a digital product passport for specific items which the organ organizations can then use as proof for batteries, so for example, for batteries. Um, so yeah, well, the that platform then provides the um, the CO two ESG and due diligence information. Um, so this is then creating a new sort of object, uh, that digital passport that got a lot that could be tracked throughout its life as well. So if that, for example, if that battery. Um, sit in the car for five or ten years and then it degrades and but it's still uh, so there's life events that could be added to that battery then so to track the whole um, history of it to check at the end of certain points in time if that battery is still viable for a second life for storage devices or if it then gets recycled um, they can then determine through the passport what's the certain materials that's inside of it, what recycling processes to use, or and also the value of that item, depending on the amount of cobalt or whichever rare minerals is in that um, specific battery. This is also then promoting um, a more circular economy, so that everything don't just, at the end of it, they, you don't have any data about the battery, and it's recycled by default, but if if it could be reused in another industry to add, to create value for that. So that everything isn't just um, used once, 
and then the spirit of. Um, so the, our main area which we're looking at is for EV batteries, but in the system we can also configure this for other industries like construction, the organizations need to prove the uh, green steel or recycled steel being used in construction projects um, and other areas this can be adapted for. So the same as we can set up a, for example, a EU battery passport template, which we can then extract the relevant information out of the platform for the EU regulations. We can set up a EV tax credit template for the US so that if they need to prove where in the world the material are coming from, and it's not from, it's more, more from friendly countries, um, then at, in order to get the tax credit, that can help them with that proof as well. Yeah, so uh, this is just an example of the green steel. So some of this data can then be made public, uh, publicly accessible for anyone to view but there's also the security and selective disclosure part of this. So if a recycler might have a need to see additional details that's not public, or a auditor can see all the details, all that security is then built into the platform as well. So that depending on your rights, you, only the relevant information is disclosed. Right, underneath it all. Um, so, we have a, so it's software as a service that is running on Oracle Cloud at the moment. So if I talk through the data flow here. So on the left we have, so you can access it via browser. We have the mobile app, mobile app that you can use to interact with it, to capture data or look up um, information for the data already on the system. Um, but most of the data which we get onto the platform are through RESTful APIs. So again, trying not to be intrusive to any existing systems, but we make an API available, agree with them the data format and the structure and the data fields we need for the platform, share that with them, and then they start to send us the data in as real time as possible um, for us to accept that and start to stitch all those items together uh, to do the calculations and validation. Um, yeah, and the, we don't have any IoT devices on it yet, but in the future we hope to have uh, incorporate like smart meters uh, in it for energy usage in order to get more real-time information for specific production lines when the items are being produced, incorporating that. So instead of a user having to enter the energy usage once a month, um, that we can get that directly out of existing systems uh, to be more reliable and more accurate so this is then going into a uh, Oracle database um, where we do most of the processing and there's a Dremio data lake attached to this and Tableau for a reporting solution. Then, the, uh, then we have APIs that goes to the blockchain instances. So we don't write because of the volume of data and the problem we're trying to solve, we're not writing all of this data to the blockchain. We only create a hash of the specific the relevant data, write that hash as then proof of evidence or uh, to ensure that the data hasn't been tampered with and hasn't been changed. Um, we do have another client that we're currently working with and their data is, they have a lot less data annually and for them they would like to have all their data in the blockchain because there's a, um, they want to users should be able to access all the data for their products directly from the blockchain. It, because that's lower volumes, that will work, but in the, in the, like for example, in the EV space, we don't write all of that because the, it just doesn't make sense. It, we're not trying to use blockchain as a database, uh, we're just trying to use the benefits of the, the immutability where appropriate. So the current blockchain instances are running on Oracle Cloud as well, so they have a uh, and it's Hyperledger Fabric, so they got a blockchain as a service offering, which we're making use of, uh, but that can be extended to customer. We have one customer that's got a uh, Hyperledger Fabric instance on-premise that's connected to the cloud network uh, where they get their data to, um, but the customers could also uh, set up their own Hyperledger Fabric nodes on other clouds to then link into this network. 
the so the bottom there, those application services. So it's those are mainly applicable to the data we get from the mobile devices in order to because that's a high risk area to make sure where that's coming from and material don't come don't cross borders and all of a sudden you have a high volume of material just showing up in your supply chain but it's more responsible sourcing making sure um, where it's coming from and some of these technologies help aid us in um, evidencing that and then so on the right hand side uh, just to show sort of the bigger different modules that fits together we have the circular platform this analytics uh, the blockchain services and then we have the uh, so we're trying to link into well customers normally link from their existing manufacturing systems into ours to supply the data um, and then there's also third-party blockchain instances that they can set up on premise or cloud as well um, and we have a customer that's then using some of that data to link their internal systems back to the blockchain to read some of that information to do other analytics or enhance the in-house in offering. Uh, so combining some of the traceability of the data that we get and we receive throughout the supply chain to then some of their due diligence and um, yeah, other purposes that they don't need uh, the, our primary system for. So yeah, this is private permissioned. Uh, so any approved organizations are part of this network. We don't write any personal identifying or information to that. Uh, most of the business rules and analysis are happening in the outside the blockchain, but um, because of the volumes that we need to process. Um, yeah, and then we're using for the mobile device, we use uh, facial recognition. Uh, just comparing when a user logs in, comparing them to their profile image in order to make sure it's somebody hasn't shared their password because that's quite a high risk area. But all of that stuff is only living in the database and can be removed when required. Um, yes, that's. Sort of it. Do you guys have any questions or? Anything I can explain more, or you want to know? This is probably a good question. I mean, you still probably be on the exact board in kind of what kind of like this is company that can add a supply chain and OEM with that the same type of type of information from a personal application. Um, do you think this will gain traction in other industries? I know you mentioned your own field. Um, like, will this work? Um, so, is there a yeah. uh, exactly. We, we normally try and check what problem the company is trying to solve. Yeah. And blockchain isn't just silver bullet. Oh, it's it, it makes things more complicated. <laughs> it doesn't make it easier. Um, so we normally would try to find out what's the problem, what's the incentive of um, uh, deploying and implementing a system like this. So we can because the we use the blockchain bit for the. Um, immutability and only that evidence. It could be, you don't have to take it, it could be switched off if you just want to do lightweight traceability or compliance checking and you don't, you don't have a regulatory need or an auditor or something like that that would like that deeper level of evidence or if they're not as public facing or don't, if you, depending on the industry. So a lot, yeah, a lot of it is driven by regulation and evidence for e-regulations or EV tax credits, for example. Um, it's, we, yeah, it, it depends. The, the, some, some comp the other client would like to write stuff to the blockchain because of the items which they deal with, because they're trying to um, prevent counterfeiting and a, a place that they can really evidence it and for people to be able to look it up. So sometimes that's the case, but we, I don't know. It's it, it depends on the use case if it will be more adopted. Yes. Um, interested in the initial uh, batch generation. So it's the transport of the child labor and uh, environmental damage. Do you get these actors uh, on board at all, or do you say, okay, we won't work with you guys? 
So, so we see this as a journey. The, like, until we started to develop this, there wasn't really any systems that can provide this level of transparency and visibility throughout the supply chain all the way upstream. Normally, organizations trust what their tier one says and say, okay, well, if anything else happened, that's your problem. If you say it's good, we trust you. But because of uh, more scrutiny and regulations coming in, organizations have become all responsible for their whole supply chain. And we know, beca because this is a new area in industry, there's always problems. But just, just by people knowing you're watching change their behavior already, you don't have to watch or have to visit a site. You just tell them you're watching. And so a lot of this is um, displaying anomalies or out of bounds type of data. It's not, there's not a user sitting on this eight hours a day to do stuff. It's more for the monitoring and visibility of it. So we see that as a journey, if we, we, we want to get companies on board in order to improve their um, practices and be more responsible and eliminate bad stuff happening. If we just, if you, if we just don't look at the industry totally because like th there's some stuff we won't touch or won't be part of, but in general, we look at this as journey for customers to first start to see where's the highest value of improvement. Or if you, if you can see in your supply chain of 100 suppliers and multiple minerals, where's the most um, higher CO2 values, your, most of the emissions coming from, then they can start to focus on that area and see what they can do there. And that makes it better for everybody instead of let's fix this tomorrow. It's more of a over time exposing it as we learn more of the technology, try to get more integrated with smart devices, more real time in order to slowly improve and um, then yeah, try to make it better. Um, so we, we're working with uh, some of the mining companies and we're also looking at how we can help them improve their processes. So for example, do um, pay them as they provide the materials. So that then, so we, we have a list of the, the miners, the users that can access the mobile app, but in the future, we want to extend that to register, have a registration of all the, everybody that's working on the site as well. So we know this is the um, main person who's responsible, who is his team of people, so that when they bring the material that gets graded, that they can Im get immediate mobile payment for that material as well. Currently, there's a lot of, um, say, not a lot of transparency in that area, because they might have to bring the material, it's weighed, you're not sure how much you can trust that scale. There, there, there's just different factors part of it. So we're looking at if you can pay the people with mobile payments so they don't need any cash, and that's safer on the site, they get more instant payment for it. So it's, but some of that data is not, is not shared further downstream. It's looking at just solving or improving processes at that point. And we, so we like technology alone are not going to solve or prevent any fraud or any problems, but the one person can, um, say, can, can try to fake it or can create problems. But it, we don't, it's not so much about that one data point. The thing is if we take all the data points together and we can track how many people have been on site, what's the average amount of output that's produced by a mine site, and then seeing all of a sudden there's a spike or uh, an outlier, then we can see, well, something has changed or for this season or this month, it's not what it usually is. Highlight that to the downstream organization, and then they can decide 
Do they want to send in uh, auditors to have a review or somebody to check what's really going on there? Because that will affect, that might affect their customers in three or four months when the material has gone through. So it's looking at all that data in aggregation and trying to find the hotspots, the problems, and see what how we can um, help improve. Yeah, because there's also NGOs and other um, organizations normally involved on site and is then working with them to see what improvements can be made. I think it's, there's a number of, like you have a number of angles. There's the compliance and the responsible sourcing. So part of it for certain industries being able to show the manufacturing did not go through certain regions or certain countries because then there's a tax incentive for that. Other areas it's um, uh, say to do with recycled materials as well. Companies claiming to use a lot of recycling. So an organization might, uh, when they sign the contract with, with a big company, say, we guarantee 30% recycled X in there. And it's all done. And because what we found is the, the customer then says, oh yeah, it's all good. Let's just put the traceability in, but you get so much recycled material from here. Once you start to uh, you know, onboard them and look at it, and you say, okay, well, we get all the data, but there's no recycled material in it. It's been misconfigured, or and then it comes out that when the contract was signed, the data was valid. But since then, two levels away, some of their suppliers have changed, and they forgot to notify the customer that that has happened. So until that contract re gets renewed, nobody's aware of that. So a part of this is trying to have that um, near real-time information as material is going through and then account for it. So if they do, if, if that, if the supplier was swapped out, all of a sudden there won't be any data for them into the system anymore. That will show up as a alert to say, well, this organization is, is producing items, but they don't, we don't know where it's coming from. So it's unknown provenance. Then we can check, is there another organization that we just need to add in order to complete that chain or where it is. So it's, it, it depends where the, yeah, dip different industries, different um, purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, one of the projects we're working on is currently a German battery passport project, BMWK uh, project. And in there, we look to open source some of the technology in order to make it more um, accessible and a more standardized way of providing the data for between different actors and it's more transparent and visible between them. So not necessarily this one, um, but there's other, especially with the battery passport, because there's a lot more providers and actors in that space, especially with um, first life, second life, and aftermarket use cases, we see there's a, there'll be, we, we expect there to be a lot more um, 
solution providers in that space and that data need to live for, or be transacted between all of them. So as part of that, we're looking to open source some of the, um, the code and uh, the models that's used for that. Thank you very much.